Hello, welcome everybody to another Clownversation. Today, I'm going to be talking to Michael Christensen, who is one of the primary founders of healthcare clowning in the world, folks. So don't go away. We'll be right back. It's just a conversation with a fellow clown. It's not very serious. We're clowning around. It's really just a clown All right. Thank you for joining us, everyone. My name is Barnaby. I'm the founder of Clown Spirit, where we take the power of clown and we use it to bring lightness, joy and connection to your life and the lives of everybody around you. If you're new to the Clown Spirit family, welcome. Here's a big clown hug just for you. I'd love you to hit subscribe on the YouTube channel. Share this video. Give us a like. And also, please, right now, jump into the chat. There's live chat right there on the YouTube uh, right next to the video there. You can jump in. You can say hi. Let us know where you are today, where you're joining us from. It would be so good to hear from you. And of course, if you have questions for Michael later on, then you can put them also into the chat. Now, before I introduce our mega superstar guest today, I just want to give a quick plug for an online Clown Masterclass coming up. This is part of the Clown Spirit Village suite of amazing offerings that you get when you join Clown Spirit Village. Um, I am going to put up on the screen right now the beautiful poster that you can see, the beautiful image of Holly Stop It, who is going to be teaching a masterclass called Playing with the Unknown, Clowning, Meditation, and Internal Family Systems on Saturday, February 10th. Um, it's going to be combining clown meditation and internal family systems, as I just said, and, you know, Holly's going to be guiding you through a process of self-exploration with simple, non-verbal, body-based, sensory play activities, discovering how our various inner parts, you know, like inner voices, feelings, thoughts, respond to this being in the unknown, right? Stepping into this space of the unknown. And it's particularly inspired by Holly's own experience recently of kind of abandoning her life. Uh, her career, her work, her home, everything, and spending a year in a retreat in Cornwall and um, what she's learned from that. So it's kind of based in clown, but it's going in all kinds of interesting new directions. So um, I am very, very excited about our guest today, and I'm sure you all are too. Why don't you jump into the chat and let us know Maybe uh, you have seen Michael performing uh, back in the day at the Big Apple Circus. Maybe you've even worked with him in a hospital somewhere. Maybe you've just come into contact with him in a conference or a training or a workshop or something. Maybe you've just heard of the legend of Michael Christensen. Whatever your connection is, it'd be great to know uh, there. Just throw that into the chat as well as, you know, just let us know where you are today. It's always cool to know the geographical locations. So, in some ways, uh, our guest today doesn't really need uh, uh, an, so much an invitation because he's so well known. But in case you've been living on the moon, Michael Christensen is, in fact, one of the co-founders of the Big Apple Circus, which is, uh, you know, a legend in the field of circus. In I'm going to say the 1970s in New York, he's going to correct me on that. And he also, well, he directed the the clown program at uh, Big Apple. He was also the creative director. And then later he founded Clown Care Unit, which went on to have um, sub organizations all over the United States and really became a huge influence and pioneer in this whole field of healthcare clown. And many organizations all around the world have emulated what Clown Care Unit did. There's a lot more to talk about, and we're going to talk about it. So please welcome to the stage a big hand for Michael Christensen. Hello, oh, Michael. Hello. <laughs> I hear them applauding. They are. They're, they're, they're applauding that you can hear them from all over the world. They're very excited. I don't think I've ever been called Super Clown Megastar. Thank you. Well, it's very well deserved. Michael, thank you so much uh, for joining me in the conversations. It's a great honor. 
Oh, thank you for having me. And let me get this out of the way first. I'm so nervous. <laughs> I'm so nervous. But I guess I'll manage. It's so <laughs> ironic that, you know, you've performed how many hundreds or thousands of times in front of huge audiences. And uh, I know, but I, I, I decided a long time ago that being nervous, if I weren't nervous, I'd really be nervous because being nervous isn't that far from being excited. And I am very excited. Yeah, I've, I've heard the expression that fear or nervousness is just excitement without breath or something. Like oh, that. I like that. I like that. That's very good. So welcome to my office. Yeah. And in a moment, uh, in a little while, well, you're going to take us on a I hope on a tour of some of the beautiful photos and images. Oh, absolutely. Your office. Um, I just want to quickly um, jump into the chat and see that people have been commenting here. And uh, we have Paul Hooson. Paul hey. Hooson. Hi, Paul. Good to have you here, Paul. You're I said I can here. actually join the chat. All right. Super. Yeah, I'm sure that I'd love to have, have you on conversations at some time, Paul. Um, Jackie Reynolds in the Hudson Valley of Eastern Upstate New York. Welcome, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Welcome, Mike, old friend from Salem, Oregon. Um, oh, Jackie says 20 plus years ago, Michael was at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck. So oh my gosh. I think they kicked me out of there because I did something bad. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that what we're supposed to do? Yeah, that's our job. <laughs> Um, hi jackie jackie yeah david langdon absolutely uh, david hi david i love you thanks for tuning in yeah and heart of circus i know heart of circus i can't remember who you are but you, you're always on every week so welcome heart of circus oh i see hillary oh hillary's here awesome to have you here, here hillary that's so great hi hillary from Vampire here. Jack Puppet is alive and well downstairs. Just I know you were probably wondering, but he's doing very well. Oh, Heart of Circus is actually is actually Paul, right? Thanks, thanks for clarifying that, Paul. <laughs> Michael, um, such a pleasure. Do you? I don't I don't know if you remember the last time that we did an interview together. I do not, sir. <laughs> but <laughs> hey, it, uh, I'm forgetting a lot of things these years. So. There's no reason you should remember. It. It's very unmemorable. But I was doing a PhD at Northwestern University in, uh, probably 15 years ago. And uh, it was in clown. You know, I was researching clowns. And I remember calling you and, and arranging an interview and being very nervous myself. And I, it was an old-fashioned phone interview, but I recorded it and I used it in my PhD. Oh, fantastic. Great. Very nice to hear you again. Yeah, you too. <laughs> <laughs> so... I always begin with this question because it's 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 pretty fascinating usually. I would love to know what was it that got you into clowning in the first place? Like what how were you bit by that clown bug? Well, there I never made a conscious decision to be a clown. Never. Mm. I was trained at the University of Washington professional actor training program, went 2 years undergraduate and then joined the uh, actor training program and then I did regional theater for a couple of years. And then I auditioned for the San Francisco Mind Troupe in the middle 1970s. And it's a political group doing outdoor theater, employing comedy, Committee dell'arte, and uh, heavy on the politics. That wasn't so interesting for me. What was really interesting is that they had a teacher of circus arts. And when I saw two people juggling, passing six clubs, that's what bit me. I went, oh, my God, I want to learn to juggle. I just loved it. So I joined, I auditioned, joined, and I got a really good political education. And I loved doing the outdoor uh, theater. And I loved learning to juggle. And yes, we did shows at that time against the Vietnam War uh, in support of women's liberation, uh, supported the longshoreman strike, and juggled. So Larry Pozzoni, go ahead. You had a so, question. No, I'm just curious because you said you weren't interested in politics, but then you became interested during that's the, right. that time. That's right. And yeah, it was yes, uh, absolutely. Larry Pizzoni, who is the founder of the Big Apple uh, Big Apple Circus. <laughs> no, no, Michael, he's not the founder of the Big <laughs> Apple Circus. You're one of them. Remember? 
Yeah. Larry Pizzoni founded the Pickle Family Circus, and he was the teacher of circus arts at the Mime Troupe. And actually, I'm I'm getting to the point where I'm going to become clown, but there is a bit of a narrative between now and then. So Larry and I, once I got to a certain level of proficiency, created a comedy juggling act, which we performed on the streets at Sproul Plaza in Berkeley and Union Square in San Francisco. And we realized that we actually, in an afternoon of that, we earned more money passing the hat than we were making at the Mime Troupe. And I could combine the skills that I had learned at theater school with juggling now, and it was based in comedy, and we were making, I mean, at that time, it's, it's not good money, but all of a sudden I realized that we, could, we were earning some money. And even more importantly, this was a ticket to anywhere in the world I wanted to go. Yep. So Larry and I hatched a plan. He was going to meet me in London, uh, and then we would start the great adventure. Well, to make this uh, the move along in the narrative, he stayed behind and created the Pickle Family Circus. I got a call from Paul Binder, who, whom I auditioned at the Mime Troupe, hired, and he learned to juggle as well. He said, I hear Larry can't make it. How about me? I said, come on. So he spent a couple of months driving a cab in New York. I spent a couple of months picking apples in Paddock Wood, Kent, England, and he joined me, and we put together... Uh, juggling act based on the one that Larry and I did and then made it our own. Now, we started what I call the great adventure. Over a period of 18 months, we juggled from London to Istanbul with a lot of adventures in between. I had a good basis in German. Paul had a high school knowledge of French and believed that the louder you spoke, the more likely someone could understand you, which <laughs> is not really the case. Uh, more stories than that, but for later. So we had this great adventure, and then to jump to uh, the end of that, although there are a lot of nice stories in between. We'll we were discovered, to, excuse me? We'll come back to some of those stories, I hope. That's great. We were discovered on the street corner of Saint-Germain-de-Prés by an usher of the Casino de Paris, Casino de Paris, large music hall, uh, Moulin Rouge, lots of beautiful ladies and feathers and lots of uh, songs and dance. And the curtain, in front of the curtain, they would hire variety acts while they changed the scenery. So the usher thought we were good. There was an opening. We auditioned. Uh, we got the job. So we would come on in front of that curtain, do our little juggling act, and then uh, go enjoy Paris. We appeared on a French national television show as part of that uh, program. And Annie Fratellini and Pierre Tex, Annie Fratellini, fifth generation circus clown, Pierre Tex, actor, filmmaker, magician, painter, beautiful, beautiful white clown. They were putting together their circus, the Nouveau Cirque de Paris. They hadn't uh, completed it yet. They saw us on this television admission and thought we were funny. And then they came to the Casino de Paris, saw us live, and still thought we were funny, fortunately. <laughs> and then uh, they asked us if we would join them in the, their press and doing some shows with them to promote interest in their, in their circus. They said, absolutely. We loved it. So now, 18 months later, right, all those adventures, we had an English show, obviously. We had a French show. We had a German show. We realized that we only needed about 15 words and we could do our show in any language. And we were burnt out. We were fried. So I remember it's really a, a very cinematic image at a hotel room, Rue La Pique, maybe, and Montmartre. We have our equipment laid out. We've got seven clubs, six normal clubs, and the Romanian Fast Club. We have our, our third partner, Leonard, the rubber chicken. We have five rubber balls of rubber fish named Ronald, a very unsung, enough about Ronald. And we were dividing the equipment. I came off with the, the best part of the deal. I got the clubs and I got Leonard the chicken. So who could ask for more? <laughs> so I went to, I accepted a contract at the Seattle Repertory 
Paul went back to New York. Calendar goes. In the spring, we got a call from Annie and Pierre. We have our circus. We would like you to join the circus. Wow. Who could refuse? So I, uh, I flew out to New York. Paul and I got our act together, flew to Paris, and joined the French One Ring Circus in a suburb, Bobigny, outside of Paris, a little green tent. It held about eight or 900 people. And I'm telling you, we were like kids. We were like kids. We had found a home, first of all. And we literally peeked through that curtain and watched Annie and Pierre work their magic mm -hmm. and literally said to each other, do you believe it? We're in a circus. And it wasn't, it, it was a circus that was in, in, imbued with the spirit of clown. Not, no, not every act it was classical circus and equestrians, tumblers, all this, but every one of those had this wonderful sense of joy to them that emanated from Annie and Pierre. Mm -hmm. So we were, we, we were a triumph. They loved us. We loved that. We went on a tour and uh, we had a break between the summer tour and uh, the, the Christmas season in Paris. Paul went home to New York. I picked grapes in Southern France. And when he came back, he had, he had spawned the idea. He said, I'm in the process of raising a quarter of a million dollars to start our own circus in New York. So we don't have to come 6,000 miles to do this wonderful work. You want to help me? Yep. 1977, we opened our first show in a little green tent that held about the same number of people as Annie and, and, and Pierre's under the shadows of the World Trade Center in, uh, on a landfill. And we had clowns. I'm still getting, I'm going to get there. How did I become a clown? I'm, I'm moving towards the objective. This is a I'm, fantastic story. I'm, <laughs> I'm hooked. So we had two clowns that first year, Nickel and Freckle, two clowns uh, who were trained at the Moscow Theater School, Moscow Circus School. And they were head teachers at the New York School for Circus Arts, which was part of our organization. And they were good clowns. They did, they did great. So the second year, and I can't remember why they didn't clown, but they didn't, and we needed clowns. And Paul and I said, okay, we'll do it. It was a job that we needed to be done. We knew that we could easily transform our juggling act into clown, and we'd seen enough classical routines in Europe that we could, we, we managed. <laughs> so that year, Oh, that, that was the year that we opened at Lincoln Center and we decided to go classic. I became a white-faced clown and Paul became the August. And he did a pretty good job and I sucked. <laughs> I had enough technique. I looked beautiful. I know that's that sign, the white face all the beautiful costumes. And I had enough technique to pull everything off. All of the pieces worked, but I, I, I was not comfortable. I was so uncomfortable. I just felt trapped. Mm. So we weren't about, I wasn't about to go out into the summer tour as a white faced clown. So I was searching for other classical clown types and I came across Emmett Kelly and the hobo. So that season I became a hobo clown, and Paul migrated into the role of ringmaster. And these are the roles that we stayed in throughout the course of our careers with the Big Apple Circus. Mm. I came out, didn't know what to call me, so we said, okay, call me Mr. Stubbly, Stubbly, hobo clown, Stubbly. But we did a lot of fairly quick uh, dialogue. So that was, that was just too much to get our mouths around. So we shortened it to Stubbles, Mr. Stubbles. Okay, Mr. Stubbles, but it's still too much. So we cut it down to Mr. Stubbs. So I became Mr. Stubbs. And Mr. Paul became Mr. Paul, the ringmaster. And then it began to unfold, began to unfold. Uh, other clowns came to us. Barry Lubin, who became iconic grandma. Mm -hmm. 
a, a, a real white clown, Carlo Pellegrini, was there, and our fantastic fall down, go boom clown, Jeff Gordon. So mm -hmm. in a few years, we had a really fine team. I could handle the dialogue, a pretty good writer, and we I wrote and handled a lot of the text. Uh, Carlo is beautiful. He is a dancer, beautiful white clown. Jeff has just got this amazing physical comic uh, ability. And grandma is grandma. What can I say? We had a ball. We had so much fun. So. It's a it's a really a really fantastic story, Michael. And uh, um, Mike Mike's just written. When are you going to write the book? Because and I'm having the same question because there's so much richness and you've skipped over so much that that I'm fascinated by and I want to know more about and we can talk a bit I have the book second. I have the book I need to publish it in English oh wow you it's have already that. published in German it's a long story I went I had the book done a few years ago tried to get it published here ran into a lot of roadblocks wasn't ready to self-publish uh, bless her heart, a dear friend, Laura Fernandez, is in touch with uh, a German publishing company. And one thing led to another, and the, the book was actually published in German. Wow. So you're still looking for the English language publisher? I have some revisions to do, but yes, I'm focused on that now to, to revise that. And yeah, lots of good oh, stories. Amazing. Well, well good stories. when that comes out, we'll have a big uh, launch party and thank you that would yeah. be so, thank you that's very kind that's a good motivation to get yeah. it even yeah thank <laughs> so you so much if the people are watching have questions um a particular you know kind of digging deeper into what michael's just told us about this whole journey because i know i have questions but i'd love you know you watching at home to kind of to lead this so whatever you would like to know um about that whole journey I mean, I have images of you in a, <laughs> an orchard in Kent. Um, Picking apples. All right, apples. let me let me just give you a quick one uh, right off the bat here. Yeah. In our juggling act, and we carried it right on through to the last time we did it in 1989, there's a sequence that started with a mistake. It was actually a mistake. I threw Paul a hat. He dropped it. So now we had to pick it up. So that became an integral part of the act. Now, in, in English, right, you say, uh, pick pick up the, Paul, the hat, Paul. Paul, pick up the hat. Pick it up. Pick it up. Look out. Because when he'd start to pick it up, I'd throw him a club. Look out. Well, in German, we did show in German, and, and uh, I had to walk him through the cues. So in German, look out is pass auf. So his hat's down there. In German, you say, pick it up. Hepin auf, Paul. Hepin auf. And I'd throw him a club and say, pass auf. And it happened again. I say, pass off. Happened again. And after the show, he came up to me and said, Michael, why do you keep telling me to piss off? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> piss off. <laughs> said, well, that wasn't what I was saying, but it's okay. The beauty of language and uh, confusion that arises. Oh, we had so much fun. That rubber chicken um, is a poulet. Prenez in French is to take. So I'd give him, I'd say, J'ai un cadeau pour toi, Paul. Un cadeau pour moi. Donne-moi le cadeau. So I give him the chicken. He said, qu'est-ce que c'est? He said, c'est un poulet. C'est quoi? C'est un poulet. And he said, prenez le poulet. Si vous poulet. <laughs> That's good. I still remember that. You do. That's, that tripped off the tongue. Yeah. Well, you say, I, it so, you say it so often, you know. I'm very impressed also by your memory of all these place names that you just you just like i can't remember things like that from five years ago to learn, uh, you know i don't know how that works uh i can't remember where i put my glasses half the time but <laughs> it's like these these files of all of this information okay. sometimes it just come out and say okay yeah they're there um so i'm still looking for your questions folks if you have any questions put them into the chat i can I, take you on a tour of the office if you want yeah, can we? Can I just ask one question, and then we'll do that. So I'm imagining you watching these routines uh, with Annie and um, Francois. No, Pierre. Pierre. Yeah. Pierre. Yeah, I don't know why I said Francois. Just a random French name. 
um <laughs> annie and pierre so can you tell us give us a little insight into what types of routines they were doing that were inspiring to you well they're since the beginning of circus there and you probably heard this from dominique jean doe a real circus historian there are groups of there's material that has passed on through the ages called their classic clown entrees and people at one point circus was so popular that people would come to see how a specific group of clowns did a specific entree which the people knew mm. so much of Annie's, some of Annie and Pierre's uh, material were, was classic. And I'll give you an example, which we actually transformed this into a routine in our show. So Pierre would come out, beautiful, elegant, elegant white faced clown, microphone would come down and he start talking about music and quarter notes and on and on. And then Annie would come out with a little box like this and open it up into the microphone and it's a music box and we just go ding 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 he gently close it sorry you're interrupting me uh uh uh, uh. he continue continue she comes up again Boop, be, 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 be. oh maybe you didn't understand you're interrupting me uh, 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 uh. third time right it's always the third time uh he closes it motions for one of the ring crew to come over takes out a hammer Bam, 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 bam. Throws it in the, gar in the garbage can, bang, puts a lid on it, gives it to her. He starts again his lecture. She comes over to the uh, microphone with the garbage can, takes off the lid, and the music comes out. It's a classic, classic piece of material, which they did so well. Mm. Paul and I adapted that to Bubbles. Mr. Stubbs would come out, i blow some bubbles. He'd come out and say, Mr. Stubbs, I'm sorry, you can't do that here. He'd leave. So I, as the clown mind, right? Oh, you can't do that here. Okay. So you go over there. So I blew the bubbles over there, which was not <laughs> He comes over, he said, no, you can't do that here either. Okay. So when he was gone, I blew bubbles again. He came out, demanded the bubble maker i gave it to him oh sad clown called for the garbage can to come out opened up the garbage can threw it in boom and there's that wonderful moment where you as an as an actor you can have you go you, you have a long way to go from that ring over to that garbage can that has your bubbles in it so that's it's very rich so i can come over there and take the garbage can lid off and then the bubbles up the bubbles came pop one a music note plays pop another one music note plays and the core the um, composer had composed a nice tune off of the bubbles mm. they could pop they finished put the lid back on and leave the ring so mm. classic material from Annie and Pierre. Well, it wasn't from them. It's uh, existed for a long time. The music box. Isn't that in Tristan Remy's book collection? It is. It is. And both Annie and Pierre were uh, professional musicians. Mm. So they use a lot of music, a lot of music. I love your, yeah, David just says, I love your variation on that entree. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, I just love that routine as well because it has such a metaphorical depth to it. You know, this, this idea of something delicate and small and beautiful that gets put in a trash can and then. Right. Like, Cause that, and that doesn't stop it. Yeah. The spirit of joy will not be stopped. It's so that's gorgeous. Love it. Yeah. So Jackie wants you to talk about clown care unit, but I wonder if we could do the tour first and oh sure, and then we'll we'll move on to chapter two, which is um, talking about the hospital and healthcare clown. All right, come along with me. All right, I'm going uh, to make, I'm make you big here so that we can see these beautiful things on the wall. All right, for years, one of the uh, members of our staff, Big Apple Circus, is he's a watercolorist. 
And every year he would do a watercolor of beautiful clowns and he would give me one. So tell me if you can see these all right. Yeah, you can go closer. I think that is Brock. Oh, wow. Yes. Here's a nice one of Brock. Oh, oh go gorgeous. Yes, I can see that. And he did this one. He did the Last Supper with all clowns. Can you see that? Yeah. That's so great. Are they actually recognizable clowns? Yes, they are. Yeah. And then uh, a few years ago, Vladimir Olshansky and his his group were asked to put a clown care program in the Vatican. So he sent me this picture of him and Pope Benedict. Can you see it? Yeah. That's the joke, you know. You say, hey, I recognize Dr. Bobo, but who's the guy in the red cape? <laughs> I love it. Here's yeah. me and uh, a beautiful little boy named Carmelo. There's a great story about him with the healthcare clowning. Here we have, I just like this picture because it's a forest full of dancing bears. That's wonderful. Yes, great revelry. Two years ago, I, I through DNA analysis with Ancestry.com, I realized I'm Swiss, and there's my Swiss family. I'm sure you'll all recognize them, right? Edmund, and okay. Yeah, very well known. Uh, with uh, Carmelo, Life Magazine did a, in 1992, a major article about us. We did not get the cover, but the magazine was generous enough that they mocked one up for me. So it looks like we appeared on the cover. There's a nice uh, picture of me looking into the circus ring. Can you see it okay? Yeah, that's that's a lovely picture. Just the sort of the backstage feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, Here's an early picture of our clown team. <laughs> uh, Let's see, I'm there on the left, there's Gordoon on the right, and that's Grandma. And let's see, I think <laughs> that was taken at 50th and 8th Avenue at the old <laughs> Madison Square Garden parking lot. <laughs> Looks like they're doing a little construction there. <laughs> that's awesome. These are some ceramics my daughter's made. All right, moving right along here. Got a couple of wards. Mm -hmm. There's another... Uh, when that article came out, the French, there's a Spanish artist that just decided he would do this painting and send it to me. What a lovely gesture. Yeah. Some right more Hopi clowns. There's a little stubby used to terrify my daughters. <laughs> this, puppet. this was a present, Norman Rockwell painting. Oh, I have a print of that exact same painting. Yep. Isn't it great? Yeah, I absolutely love that. Here is a piece of medical equipment. This is a cardiac accelerator. You can see it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. Here's some clowns. There's someone we all know with some children. Yep. And here's some other, uh, there's another beautiful painting or picture of the circus. Yes. There's an early picture of me, my wife, and our older daughter, Ivy. Beautiful. So I think that's it. I got a trombone here. Got some toys. I love tops. You ever see the film Inception? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love these things. I don't know if I can get it going, but I could try. You know, I started using these, I started using these in the workshop because they're great focus. I could just do that and Everybody becomes focused really, really quickly. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Good for good for children. Okay, so there's a tour. Thank you so much. What a treasure trove. So a couple of questions coming up here, which I think would take us into the um, clown care unit years. Okay. You sort, of, you sort of taken us up to that point. Um, and Jackie says, please tell us about Big Apple's circus uh, clown care work. Was your team featured on one of the hospital television shows? The daring young man on the flying trapeze played on a syringe. Oh, you're moving right along there. Yeah, we've, we've skipped a little bit. Do you want to yeah. do you want to tackle the the um, 
yeah, I will give you that came into being. Yeah, so I'll give you, I'll give you a, a story. First of all, when Paul and I founded the circus as a charity, and thank you, San Francisco Mind Troop, for that political education. Mm -hmm. We wanted to create an organization that would benefit the communities in which we performed. So, as a not-for-profit organization, we had community outreach programs. We we have Circus of the Senses, which we modified the show for hearing and sight uh, challenge kids. Mm. We had Circus Arts into the schools. So it was a it was a good program. <sighs> okay. In 1985, I lost my brother to pancreatic cancer. Before he passed, he gave me a medical bag thinking that his brother, the clown in the circus, might have some use for a medical bag. He passed. I can never tell. Uh, <laughs> okay. Doggone it. The grief of his passing motivated me to commit my life to service in whatever that meant. The bag sat in my closet. He died in October. It sat there for October, November, December, January, February, March, April. It just sat in my closet. In May, I got a call from a woman at uh, then it was Baby's Hospital, part of Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, who had seen Mr. Stubbs in the ring. She, I have to tell, <laughs> I'm in my office. The phone rings. I pick it up. There's a female voice. He said, is this Michael Christensen? I said, yes. He said, Mr. Christensen, I've been secretly in love with you for years. She wasn't so much in love with me as she was in love with Mr. Stubbs in the ring. This hospital was a surgical child, surgical cardiac surgery specialty facility. And every year they would have a day called Heart Day, where they would celebrate that the children were alive. And they'd have all the directors, all the parents, siblings, and all those children. So she asked me if I would come and perform. Yes. And I went, oh my gosh, I have a medical bag. And then as we move through this, Barnaby, you'll, you'll wonder the same question that I do. Who's writing this story? Who's writing this story? So to get information, I go onto the floors of Baby's Hospital in plain clothes. And I start looking at the hospital through the eyes of a circus clown. And one of the tools that's very important for a circus clown is the art of parody. When that beautiful ballerina comes out on the horse and in that tutu and does this most beautiful uh, tour around the ring, the music stays the same, the lighting stays the same, the curtains open up and a clown comes out on a donkey in the same tutu and tries to do the same moves, parody. So now I'm looking at the hospital, I'm going, no ballerinas, no juggling act, no trapeze. Oh, but we have a lot of procedures, a lot of procedures going on. Ring, no ring master in a white coat, but oh, there's a master of the sinks in a white coat. Oh, he's the authority figure, white coat, a lot of all these. Okay, you kind of get the picture. So I come back to grandma and, and Gordoon, we instantly parody the doctor, put on our white coats. Mr. Stubbs becomes Dr. Stubbs. Grandma becomes chief dietitian grandma. And Mr. Gordoon becomes disorderly Gordoon. So now May 18th, the spring 1986, Alumni Auditorium, 168th Street and Broadway. The three of us, the three professional idiots are in the back. Nobody knows that there are clowns coming on. Now, you know, it's not going to be that surprising if a clown walks onto the stage at a hospital. In 1986, it was pretty surprising. So nobody knew. And I got one of the best introductions of my professional career by Dr. Peter Salgo, who was in an NBC medical correspondence. So he told everybody what uh, a pleasure it was to, to have me there, how honored he was. He cited the journals I'd been published in, uh, he had studied under me at medical school. He just went 
on and on and on about my credentials as um, as a physician. And I turned to, to Barry or to to Jeff. I said, God, this guy's great. He's doing a great job. <laughs> so he did all the work. Mm-hmm. All I had to do with my brother's medical bag in my hand and my white coat and a hat, my stubby legs and my costume and my makeup is just walk out. I just walked out after that introduction and people laughed. So I told told everybody it was great to be in charge of another hospital. We're going to be making changes. Grandma came out, talked to everybody through popcorn eating techniques. Mr. Gordoon came out and had a wrestling. At that time, parents, if they wanted to stay in the room, they have uh, these god-awful lawn chairs that they would give them. So Mr. Gordoon came out and had a wrestling match with one of these contraptions. And, of course, the contraption won. Now, the short story is, oh, no, I have to tell you that. I have to tell you that. There was a little girl whose heart had been transplanted by Dr. Rose. So we had her up on stage along with Dr. Rose, who sat in the chair, and we assisted her in what we think is pretty much the first red nose transplant on Dr. Rose. So we switched the roles, which is really came to be an important dynamic of hospital clowning that is still used right now. We empowered her. So we assisted her in a red nose transplant. It was 20 minutes. You you talk about coming home. It was 20 minutes of the most fulfilling work I'd ever done. And they say that Mark Twain wrote it. Sometimes that's questioned. The two most important days of a person's life are the day they are born, of course, and then the day they find out why. And that day I found out why. Now, I wish, you know, all you people, all you people who are watching, all these people think I created it, right? I wish I could take, I could claim that. Dr. Michael Katz, director of pediatrics at that time at Baby's Hospital, we're talking afterwards. He said, you know, that was great. I wonder if there's a way we could bring this to the kids on an ongoing basis. I said, good idea. And then I don't want to get, I don't want to sound woo-woo. I don't want to get that, blah, blah, blah. but you know what? Joy does find its way. Joy finds its way. And things begin to unfold we got a grant from the Altman Foundation to support a five-week pilot program restricted to the inpatient service of babies. And during those five weeks, we put together the rudiments of hospital clowning, the empowerment of the child. We realized that as artists, as clowns, we could become more helpless than any child that we faced. We asked permission to come in. If even if they said no, that was great because they never get to say no about anything. So we realized that we switching the roles where they are put in charge and we are the ones who are needy is a very powerful dynamic. We realized, oh, we're there for the patients. We're there for the parents. Okay. As you're working with a child, you know, you feel the patient's joy, the patient's, the, the parent's joy, the parent's gratitude. We say, okay. Oh, we're there for the staff. Okay, then a real big one, real big one was after the first three, really in the first 15 minutes after the first three rooms, Jeff and I are walking around the halls totally depressed like this, because at that time, you can't do it now because of confidentiality. We could go to the nurse's station and find out what was wrong. So after about three rooms, we were so full of what was wrong, we were totally depressed. And then that's when we realized we are, we can accept what was wrong, but that's not what we're there for. And that's not where we put our energy or our focus. We put our energy and our focus in what is right mm. without denying all the other stuff. Mm. And it wasn't hard to find what is right when you're working with playing with a child. You know, they're, they're just ready. This This wonderful thing of play. I mean, and you've had... Barnaby, you've had so many people talking about this dynamic in whatever form, in some form or another, but it's the same, it's the same spirit. It is the same spirit of play that gets us all here, that 
makes these amazing transformations that do that does transform things. So, okay, getting back to the logic of it, empower the kid. We're there for all those other people. And we also realized that because we're making ourselves vulnerable, we needed um, emotional support, which we find in our partner, which we find in ourselves, which we find in any number of ways. And then as it grew, uh, Barnaby, we, we formalized it into a circle of emotional support. So we had the rudiments and, and the power of duos. Mm. Remember the circus, that classical duo, that was the comedic potential, and there's emotional support there. And when you have a duo, you can always have one because sometimes it's not appropriate to have two. But if you only have one, you can never have two. See what I mean? Yeah. So in those five weeks, we uh, pretty much created the, the rudiments of medical clowning. And then, as I said, it began to unfold. Uh, New York Times in an article, some another hospital finds out they want us, and uh, I'm still on the road. Lane Barton shows up, please, Lane, you do this. And then all these people, all these amazing people start as a magnet. All these amazing people started coming in four really important ones, Caroline Simmons, Laura Fernandez, uh, Vladimir Olshansky, and my dear brother, <laughs> in Brazil, do Torres da Alegria, Wellington Santos. Mm. So those four came, worked with us, and then out they went. Rio de Medicine in Paris, do Torres da Alegria in Brazil, the Clown Doctorin in Germany, Sorcoso Clown in Italy, and our dear friend that I showed you the pictures of in the Life magazine. I'm looking at the clock. Okay, I can tell this story. Please. So I'm in the dialysis unit of Baby's Hospital, Dr. Stubbs. I walk by a kid who's on dialysis, tip my head. He says, fuck off, clown. So, okay, that's direct. So I did, wrote my name, telephone number down, gave it to a nurse. I said, in case he wants to call. I don't know why I did that. So I wasn't home when he called. My wife was. So I came home. She said, I had an interesting telephone call today. I said, yeah, what? She said, well, I picked up the phone and there's this voice that sounded a little bit like a munchkin. I said, is Dr. Stubbs there? I said, no, could I take a message? And when he realized he was talking to a female, he said, how you doing, babe? <laughs> I, said, I said, okay. Then he said, tell, <laughs> tell Dr. Stubbs that Carmelo called. So this was the beginning of a long, that maybe, uh, two years. There are people out there who, who know this story as well, if not better than I do, two or three years. This little boy was in and out of the hospital all the time. He had heart problems, obviously kidney problems, broken home situation in the Bronx. Mm. And his turning point, oh, his turning point came working with Mark Mitten, the close-up magician. Mark was working with him and he taught Carmelo how to read minds. So he brought a doctor in and Carmelo read his mind. And you know, when, when, when a kid has fun doing a game, they say, want to do it over and over and over and over. He said, you want to do it again? So yeah, let's do it again. So he did it again. He said, let's do it again. And I don't know, I don't know many, how many minds he read. And finally Mark said, you know, you're a good little actor. He was like taking the cork out of this kid. You know, he said, oh, I'm a great little actor. I act all the time. I do this and the nurses and I'm a blah, 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 blah. And Mark said, hey, we could use a good little actor like you. You want to join the clown care unit? He said, sure. So we hired him as a member of our clown care unit, and we offered him a dollar a day. But he demanded three. Three dollars <laughs> a day. We said, okay, you little fart. Three bucks a day. So we dressed him up like a little Mr. Stubbs. And it's really remarkable and it uh, it amazed the medical staff. But knowing what we know now, it's not amazing because it has to do with this power of joy and play. He would have some procedure and he'd be in his bed and there would be no medical reason why he should have the energy to do anything. Mm -hmm. And I would peek in, I'd say, hey, Carmelo, you want to work today? 
and he just raised up. He said, yeah, let's go help the little children. And then we get them all made up and there we go. So now here's another example of who's writing this story. Okay, we're good. Our general manager is having a, a massage, talking about the circus, talking about this new program called Clown Care. The masseuse said, tell me more about that because my husband might be interested. And her husband was interested. His name was Brad Derrick and he was a chief editor of Life Magazine. So one thing led to another and Brad did a major story of Carmelo and clown care and brought attention to our work mm. all over the world. And just one example, and this woman did exist, Princess Stephanie Desvindis Gretsch of the Hopberg royal family. And those are only two of her names. She passed, I think she has like seven names. Picked up her royal copy of Life magazine, said, I want to do this. Came to New York, got a lot of uh, information, went back and through her efforts, started uh, hospital clowning programs in Belgium, in uh, uh, Holland and Germany. And one of her associates, split off from her and started the Rotenazen in Vienna, which is now the Rotenazen International. And it just is <clears throat> so wonderfully out of control. It's really amazing the how it's how it's kind of procreated itself all over the world. And I'm sure that each of those ones that you mentioned has has kind of spawned, you know, more. Now it's, you know, through South America, there's hospital clowning. It's in, in China. It's, it's all over. Australia, everywhere, yeah, yeah, and and it's not only that, but but Clown Care Unit also built a significant presence across the U.S., right? I mean, you 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 had that's right. I was reading. There's NAFCO, which is the North North American Federation of Hospital Clowning, started by Laughter League and Humor uh, Humorology Atlanta. It's funny when it's not funny. It's interesting when the Big Apple Circus went bankrupt. We had a, a whole host of hospitals. And I do liken it, I'm a gardener, I liken it to the way a strawberry plant grows. You have a mother plant, it sends out a runner, and then after a while that runner baby is independent and that little runner dies. So the Big Apple Circus Clown Care Unit had all of these little satellite plants that were quite capable of taking care of themselves after a while. You had their artists, their own funding sources, their own administration, they were fine. So at the collapse of the Big Apple Circus, some of these plants became their own organizations and it just moved. And uh, Karen McCarty, Deborah Kaufman, Dina Paul Parks, they saw the writing on the wall as the circus mm. was going down and she created healthy humor and, and has the, got the lion's share of all of the programs that were in, uh, originally was Big Elf Circus Clown Care Unit. But what I started to say is now there's North American hospital uh, Healthcare clowning organizations started by Humorology Atlanta and Laughter League with two veterans, uh, Tiffany Riley, Dick Monday. You've interviewed them both. And of course, in Europe, there's the uh, European Federation of Hospital of uh, Healthcare Clowning Organization. They made me an honorary member and they had their first meeting that I could attend in Rome. So I, I couldn't resist, you know. I got the music playing and I got the mustache. You know. I welcomed all the clan families and I told them how honored I was to, to be here and I wish them the best. So there you are. It was fun. I'd, like to, I'd like to, we, we're almost out of time, but I really want to talk about the, the, the present and the future a little bit. Um, there, there was an interesting message here in the chat from somebody in France um who doesn't give their actual name but maybe the, from an organization called the regulation emotionnelle and he or she says all new to me which is cool right this is like we have people listening who are completely fresh to this 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 field happy to listen to the stories all the way from all the way from france do you continue to teach in 2024 25 Absolutely. Uh, lately, I've been in Germany a lot with the Humor Hilft Highland. Humor helps, uh, helps to heal. And they're do doing something amazing. Okay, the short, the short story, because we're getting out of time, is that uh, 
back in the early 90s, my team and I found a way to transform a lot of the uh, clown exercises to make medical clowns to, we just shifted them a little bit for medical staff because we realized a lot of those skills, extending empathy, reading the room, body language are very fantastic skills for uh, healthcare professionals. Well, now, Humorhilf Highland in Germany, I, I taught trainers that workshop 10 years ago. And they just invited me uh, last month to their 10th anniversary where they have 22 trainers that do hundreds of these workshops with medical staff in Germany. And for me, this is a really, really important growth point you know, all over the world, hospital clowning organizations saying, well, what's the future? How do we do? What do we do? And, and, uh, and from my perspective, our future depends on deepening the relationship that we have with our medical partners. Mm. They open the doors to the medical schools. They open the door to the credibility. And remember, they're our original partner. It wasn't I. I'm the one who didn't say, let's do it on a regular basis. It was Dr. Michael Katz, a medical partner. So a very important for me, dynamic for the future is develop the relationship with medical staff in every and any way that we can. And maybe we'll, you know, we'll be in the medical schools. There's no class in the medical curriculum that I know of that teaches the power of being a human being with your patients. Mm. And I can't tell you how many people in these classes, medical people will find, will at some point say, wow, thank you for getting me back in touch with why I originally went into this profession to begin with. Because, you know, they're so taxed. There's so many things that they have to do. Anyway. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. I And I also wonder, Michael, about the future in terms of performers on the, you know or, or or the actual um healthcare clowns um because i remember you know i think it was deb or maybe karen saying talking about how difficult how much more difficult it was becoming finding new healthcare clowns because people didn't seem to have the basic skills or the that they weren't coming with with kind of a uh, skill uh physical skill skills. Yeah, so they were having to build all that into the training in the first place. Have you found that as well? Well, I, I, obviously, I'm in a different position. Most of my work involves already existing organizations that have professionals already working. Mm. Uh, I'm not so much on the recruitment end, but I can certainly understand. I have, this is not the first time that I've heard that that they're having they're having trouble getting artists who have some kind of performance vocabulary already. And for us, I mean, think about it. We started in New York City. You're looking for people who have performance ability <laughs> in New York City. It's not hard to find. But yes, I can see that as a challenge for the future, yeah. certainly. And also, hey, artificial intelligence. I did a, a little, a fun little thing for Theodora, one of their conferences where I walked them through how I was replaced by Robozo. And I came in one morning and and the chief of PED said, oh, I'm sorry, Michael, this is your last day. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, let's face it. You got a pretty short memory, don't you? You can't even remember where you put your glasses. I said, yes. I said, well, we're replacing you with this robot. They have 10 pen tacks of memory, whatever. They record everything. They have access to every joke that in the world from the internet. I mean, you're obsolete, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> We've replaced you with a robot, and that's not so crazy because they they have they have them mm -hmm. anyway. Looking at it from a clown's perspective, is that that's not a problem. That's an opportunity for us to have fun. So in yeah. rather, instead of introducing myself as Doctor Stubbs, I introduce myself as Doctor Google, and I have some. If you want to ask me a question because I know everything, just do it. Or you can introduce yourself as Doctor Maps and ask for directions. I, mean, I like this. This is kind of a reversal of everyone is afraid of AI taking over our jobs, but maybe the clown plays with that and plays with the idea of us taking over AI's job. Yeah, I mean, that is our perspective. It's not a problem. Paul dropped the hat. 
if we saw that as a problem, we'd never get to that routine of piss off. Right, right. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. And then let's play with it and see how we can have fun with it. And even if you just show up in the room and you, at the door when you say, is the internet connection here strong or do you need some help? I can, <laughs> I can, I can do some stuff. And all of a sudden, if they say, yes, you got the doorway open for a lot of stuff. Yeah. Or if you forget something, you could be like, oh, my signal's gone. That's <laughs> it. I did say, hey, after I perform today, would you like me? Yeah. My, I have a clown supervisor who might be in and just tell him, just give me a like, okay? Just yeah. a like. Look at all my friends. That's <laughs> yeah. right. So um, I have one more question. And unless anyone else does in the chat, you mentioned earlier who you said you're probably wondering who's writing this story. And uh, I wonder what your answer to that is. I think joy and play is writing the story. And I think my job is to make myself available to that. And to be aware, and yes, intuition. It's not as if I'm not in the picture. Of course, I'm in the picture, but I, it's not my. It's not. I'm not leading it. Joy is leading it. And again, I don't want it to sound woo woo or na 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 na. -na. For me, it's very real. It's very grounded. And you have to listen. You have to pay attention. But uh, I, I, I never told my brother to give me the medical bag, did I? I never told Virginia Kind to call me on the phone, did I? I never invited me to that. I, I just made, I made myself available. I said, yes, and I paid attention. Beautiful. Well, Michael, I feel like we just, like, just got started. Um, but we've been talking for an hour and there's been some real gold and beautiful things that you've shared. And I'm very, very excited for the book. Okay. That's a good motivation. I got it in this computer here. I just need to straighten a few things out and update it. And I think I, it'll, it's tantalizing. It's there already. I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is there. And a lot of these stories are as well. Some of these stories are there. Well, it's a wonderful story. I mean, just that journey across Europe to Fratellini uh, to the new to the to creating the circus in New York to the hospital clowning is just the it's such a great arc. I feel that this could be a Wes Anderson movie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody listening knows Wes, then let's do it. Okay. What fun! Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Michael. I really, really appreciate it. I hope you'll come back someday. Okay. Me too. Bye. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Wasn't that special? Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful soul and full of inspiration and things that I'm going to take with me and remember. Um, so thank you. Next week, I'm going to be again with Caroline Dream. Caroline hasn't been, was the first ever guest I had on Conversations. And so I thought it'd be fun to, to bring her back and see what she's doing. So we've been talking to Caroline Dream. And a big announcement, folks. In a few weeks, um, I am going to be interviewing the amazing Patch Adams. Yes, on the 16th of February. So don't miss that one. And the week before that, between Caroline and Patch, I'm going to be talking to John Turner, who uh, is an amazing clown performer and teacher of the duo Mump and Smoot. He's going to be joining me from Canada. So some very cool guests coming up. Don't forget about Holly's workshop coming up on Saturday, February 10th. This is the masterclass online. And you guys can sign up for that by just going to clown-spirit.com and finding out the information there and signing up. It is only $49 to take that masterclass. And you also get a free month in the clown spirit village which includes all kinds of other cool fun stuff okay folks it's been another great conversation i hope you enjoyed it thanks for being here see you again next week Bye.